Welcome to the Nonprofit Podcast. I'm Jenna, Nonprofit Advocate here at DonorBox. We're here each week with practical actions you can use today to confidently take your nonprofit to the next level tomorrow. Kara is on vacation, so we have a July 4th summer special in two parts to keep you informed, inspired, and entertained this holiday weekend. Today, our field reporter, Jared Polifka, sits down with the CEO and founder of Swipe Out Hunger, Rachel Sumek, to unpack the journey to end student hunger she has spearheaded for the last nine years. Swipe Out Hunger is anything but a traditional charity, and I, for one, am really keen to hear how this inspiring group of former UCLA students have driven innovative programs and national partnerships with such success. So, over to you, Jared. What a lovely home you have. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming by. Yeah, thanks for having me, Rachel. How do I pronounce your last name for the audience? It's Sue Mack. Rachel Sumek. Yep. And when we first met, I thought it was sumak, like the spice. And I'm, or is it also sumak? Sumak, sumak. It's actually it sounds very similar. Uh-huh. And I was called sumak for a long time in middle school. Mm. But um, sumach is how it's technically said, I which is the Hebrew phrase for lift. Okay. Um, and it's like often used in like specific songs and prayers to um, talk about a person who lifts people up. So you're a person who lifts people up. Yeah, my work, my work is very <laughs> in line with my destiny as Rachel Sumek. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, tell me about your work with Swipe Out Hunger. What, what do you do? How do you help people? How do you lift them up? Um, around the country, there are people who are advancing their lives. They're going to college, getting degrees, because that is what we have told them they should do if they want to get ahead. Mm. Um, what we don't think about is that many of them are struggling financially. And financial aid might play a role, Mm -hmm. but oftentimes the easiest things to cut when you have a limited budget is food. Mm -hmm. And still these students show up to school every day, nationally one in three students that don't have enough to eat. And so Swipe Out Hunger was started in 2010 by myself and a handful of friends Mm. with the objective of making sure that food is never the reason why someone doesn't graduate, especially when we have dining halls full of food, when we can easily set up food pantries on campus. Um, And so our mission is just make sure that every student has access to food. Very proud to be doing that now in all 50 states, Canada, Mexico, and on 140 college campuses. Wow. You served over way over a million meals by now. What is the stat now? I forget. We are now at 4.8 million meals. That's great. Yeah. (laughs) And you started this when you were in college, uh, when you were a junior or a a senior? Um, I was a sophomore. Okay. I'd never volunteered a day in my life. My friend Brian posted a Facebook status saying, anyone who wants to help us donate meal swipes, like I want to start this org, like just message me. Mm. Um, And I sent him a message and I showed up and I was like, wait, I just spent six hours moving food across campus Mm. and now people are going to have food. Mm -hmm. I never want to use my leadership or my voice or my time in any way if it's not stepping up to help others or even creating opportunities for others to have the same experience that I just had. So you're a sophomore. That's year, what is that? 2008, like 2009? Um, 2010. 2010. Yeah. Okay. And a meal swipe for the audience is when you swipe a card and that's your dining hall meal. Is that how it works? Exactly. Okay. So when you're in college and you live on campus, you're required to buy a meal plan, hmm. pay for it up front. You get 15, 20 meals a week. If you don't use all of them, they expire, Mm -hmm. which is a waste. So we gave students a chance to donate them to other students. So not only are you getting a meal, but I mean, we're a generation that cares, you know, where we've seen that charity in the way that we've had historically doesn't work. And I'm sure anyone who listens to this podcast agrees with this. Mm. And I think our generation, alongside many people before us and older generations have been trying to work on systemic issues and we wanted to make sure that when we gave food away, it was with the whole human in mind. As a student, they want to sit next to their friends, have a warm meal um, with dignity, really. That's great. My freshman year, I'll never forget it. I shared a meal plan with my best friend and roommate, Connor. You shared a meal plan. We bought one for one student. We bought the max plan because we realized we would save, I think, 150 to $200 each for the semester. And so we shared one. And so we had to be really good about showing up for each other and swiping. But I, 
for a couple of weeks was really bad at that. Um, I'll never forget my, both my parents were going through two different divorces at the time. Yeah. And <laughs> I kind of disappeared off the map for like a week or so. And Connor was so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and I think I forgot to give him the milk plan. So uh, we didn't, we, this is before you existed, before yeah. what a beautiful idea, what a beautiful way to help people and, and donate meals and to, you know, and I, why couldn't we partition our card? Why couldn't we split it in two? And why couldn't I donate meals to, to another card for him? Or why couldn't we just split the meals? You know, there was no way to do any of that. So. I have to say that's very crafty though. I respect it. That's a great idea. <laughs> So where did you go from there after you started the org? Like where, what direction did you go? You, you were helping students and the homeless, right? Yeah. At the time we were like, we have extra meal credits. We want to donate them. We want to help anyone. We were giving them out. Mm -hmm. um, and then we graduated in, in 2012. Okay. I went off and I did a year of service with AmeriCorps. My co-founders went off to med school in Silicon Valley um, and about a year after I finished my year, after I finished my year of service, I moved back from Chicago to LA and said, let me spend a year of my time growing Swipe Out Hunger and seeing what happens if I spend a year dedicated to this. Mm. It was amazing. It was one of the most um, enlightening years of my life. I learned so much about myself, about the world. I was captivated by the notion that I got to email people I didn't know and say, I'm working on this idea that can mm. help end hunger. And I want to meet you with you about it. And people are excited to meet with people that not only want to talk about an issue, but have a solution. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of saw it person like personally as like a 21 year old at the time, mm -hmm. an exciting way to connect with a lot of people and do something good in the world and use this as my trick to like get people to open the door and like <laughs> want to get involved with our work. Um, and about like two years <laughs> into that, I Googled how many people in the United States are hungry. And at this time, we were maybe on like five or six colleges. And I compared it to the number two years before. And the number had gone up. And mm. I'm like, what am I doing ending hunger, like in quotes, when the number's going up? Like, I don't want to just be a drop in the bucket that's mm. not solving a problem. And so at the time, we were donating a lot of our meal swipes to other students. We were using those meal swipes to buy food for the campus pantry. And I made a really intentional choice to say, we're going to end college student hunger. No one is talking about it. It's heavily stigmatized. It can really help a student get through class. And while we should be serving anyone that is hungry, this was a population that was severely underserved. Mm. And so I grew in my understanding of how to solve problems, which is the more specific you can get, the better your solution is, and the more you can actually serve the person you're seeking to, to meet their needs. That's very wise. The more focused you are, the more specific, the better you can solve that problem. Yeah. yeah. I think as a young person, sometimes we get excited. We're like, I just want to do something that matters. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a very big proponent of decentering yourself as a, like, you know, servant leadership mm -hmm. is something that is the antithesis of being a founder. Founders are like, it's my vision. I had a dream. I wanted to start something. And so like having an equal balance where the world is telling you, let's put on, you on a list, let's put you on this, whatever, whatever, right. making sure that you have that counter balance mm -hmm. in the mission space, I think is really critical. That's great. Yeah. It's, it's also less focused on, just the pure vision and the self. And it's more about um, solving the problem. It's more about the product or the program. One of my mentors, Robert Egger, um, founder of DC Central Kitchen, always says, charity is about the liberation of the giver and not the, oh, sorry. The charity <laughs> is about the redemption of the giver, having that person who's giving feel redeemed mm. and not about the liberation of the receiver. Wow. which is what it should be about. Let's start focusing on the people we're serving. So I think our fo decision to focus really on college student hunger was let's decenter ourselves. Let's really focus on solving a problem. I'll never forget being, you know, the first in my family to go to school and graduate from college and just seeing what it was like, the, the stratification of people, of the wealth, of the inequality, of the... Um, there's inequality, there's, there's equality and then there's fairness. And sometimes the two are different, right? But you know, that's what leaves like people in gaps. Mm. Like you can get by on 
friends helping you out but not everyone has those social connections it's hard though yeah it's hard it's stigmatized and not everyone has access to it yeah. so we're really you know one of my goals jared is to get u.s news and world report if anyone from there is listening to this mm. um to add food insecurity and specifically a metric that they ask for schools data on is do you have a food pantry mm. they're are like 900 colleges with food pantries. They should add this question. And I've like pitched it to them. They're thinking about it. Yeah. But like if we can get to the point where schools are adding this as a systemic thing they're working on, then mm. that makes a lot of lives a lot easier. That's so true. And then what are the th main programs that you have at, at Swipe Out Hunger to address this? I think you have three or four different programs now. Yeah, great question. Yeah. So our first program is helping campuses create on-campus solutions. Mm -hmm. So that's, if you have meal swipes, give students a chance to donate them. Mm -hmm. That's um, have a food pantry. We'll help you run a food pantry on campus. Help people enroll in SNAP, formerly known as food stamps. All these programs that exist. So question, uh, what is like a food pantry like and how is it run? Is it like the library of food? Is it like, <laughs> do I come in? What's my experience? What do, I, what do I feel? What do I encounter as a student in need? Yeah, anyone who's listening can go and probably find a food pantry at their local community college or at their alma mater, just looking online. Mm -hmm. It ranges from a literal broom closet to a massive facility. Wow. Um, some pantries have kitchens and classes that happen and some are literally like two shelves. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on if the campus has staffing. A lot of campuses have dedicated staff mm -hmm. or it's student run or they source from a local food pantry, but it's probably similar to what you're imagining. Yeah. And in case any students or parents or people who want to inform others, uh, other young people out there, what can you explain the SNAP uh, and how that works and how that program goes? Yeah. So this is a great staff for anyone interested in food insecurity in general. For every meal that the nonprofit sector serves, that's programs like Swipe. That's every food bank in America, Feeding America, Meals on Wheels, all these programs. For every meal that the charity industrial complex serves, the government serves nine it's, you can't compare the reach of the government compared to charity. Charity is not the solution to hunger, right? Mm. We're, because government doesn't fill all the needs, we step in. Um, but SNAP is a federal program where anyone that meets a certain income threshold can go online and apply for SNAP, which is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives you a debit card. You can go in the grocery store, you can go on Amazon Fresh, you can go online in person and get all the groceries that your family needs. Like up from like anywhere from 180 bucks to you know, 300 depending on how many people are in your family. That's great. Yeah. Is that the same as food stamps or different? Or Same thing. Same thing. We just rebranded. Oh, just rebranded. Yeah. <laughs> so now it's Snap. Now it's Snap. And in California, it's CalFresh. CalFresh in California. Yeah. Got in it. In Illinois, it's Link. Everyone you know, personalized it. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Um, cool. So our, That's I, our and first I, program. Okay. And I interrupted you. So yeah. please keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah. So our first program is like helping schools be better. Mm. Meal site programs, food pantries, beyond. Our second is our advocacy work. Another thing that we love to say that my director of advocacy, Rob, taught us is you don't want to just feed the people that are in line. You want to shorten the line. So how do we get it so people don't need that? So mm. um, as an organization, we're invested in advocacy and education. We've passed bills in five different states, California, Maryland, New Jersey, Minnesota, um, very close to Louisiana, Oklahoma, Massachusetts, like across the country. We're working um, in 13 different states wow. to pass what we call the Hunger Free Campus Bill, which has sent over $102 million dollars directly to colleges to end college hunger and talk about learning lessons. Like I wrote that when I was in 2017. So I was like, what, 25, 26 <laughs> had no, I was just a West wing fan. Like I'm just like a political nerd. I'm like, I'll figure out how to write a bill. Aaron, Aaron Sorkin taught you how to write yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've like, we entered into that space almost accidentally, but mm. saw a huge opportunity. So what's your next program? So, um, on-campus solutions, advocacy, and third is our network. We have an incredible community mm -hmm. of students and administrators on college campuses that are actually running these programs. Their programs run better when they know each other, mm -hmm. when they're sharing case studies with us, which we then disseminate, when they're meeting on webinars, when we're diving through data together, saying, does this resonate with you, um, and really empowering them mm -hmm. to make the work that they're doing on campus the coolest thing. Because in my opinion, Ending college hunger should be the number one priority for every college president. 
there's retention and like, you know, a lot of things they got to focus on. Mm. Um, but it's really building up that network and those advocates to really champion the movement. That makes sense. And how do you um, measure success in those efforts um, across these programs? Um, we have 27 metrics. <laughs> so 27. Like wow. Meals served, quality of the meals served, um, accessibility of those things, diversity of programs offered. 75% of our campuses mm -hmm. do more than just food. They provide referrals to homeless services. They provide pads and tampons. They um, give you access to childcare or information on childcare. So our schools are going above and beyond. What was that one? Pads and tampons. Oh, okay. Yeah, like menstrual products. Got it. Got it. They like provide school supplies, condoms, like baby formula, dog food. Like we're meeting the whole student where they're at. Right. Um, so they don't have to go and find it off campus, which they don't have time to or a car for anyway. Gotcha. Inspired by our guest. When your supporters feel the same way about your mission, put the power of speedy giving in their hands. DonorBox Text to Give is super easy to set up and lets your supporters give by sending a simple text message from their smartphones. One setup, no forms, no fuss. Ideal for on-the-spot donation drives, church services and conferences, or hassle-free repeat donations. Let the moment move you. DonorBox helping you help others. Well, that's great. Um, and then how do students find out about this? I mean, from what I've heard from talking to other nonprofit founders is that sometimes that's the hardest thing is getting the actual student population who needs it. And as someone who's also been in survival mode before when I was younger, you're less creative and you're less, um, you're less likely to find out because you're, uh, doing your classes, you're working two or three jobs, you're leading a sports club, you're doing all that you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, you know, you have all these things going on. How do they find out when they're in that, that mode of fight or flight? It's a great question. Um, the number one piece of advice we give to a school starting these programs or who's reaching out to us saying they can't reach students is we say involve students in the process. Mm. If students are actually designing the program, then one, it's actually going to be good mm. so that students will tell their friends about it. That's often the first problem. The program isn't designed well. Mm -hmm. um, and then when students are involved, they'll tell their friends. So our chapters are run by college students and then they want to tell their friends, hey, like, come be a part of this thing I helped make. Mm. Um, secondly, really effective advertising. So instead of saying, hey, are you hungry? Come to this food pantry, which is located in this basement. Mm -hmm. Saying something like two out of five students at UNC Chapel Hill stopped by the food pantry last month. This is the address to it, right? Mm -hmm. Like normalizing it if stigma is a challenge. Um, and then other than that, you just do all the methods and you flood the systems, but you really <laughs> just try and make it cool, I think. Make it cool, make it normal, yeah. destigmatize it, and, and let the students, students do the word of mouth thing. Exactly. Very cool. Yeah. Do you partner with any orgs? And, and how does that work? Yeah, I mean, well, our number one partner is at the colleges, right? right like, sure. We at Swipe Out Hunger are, well, you know, like the, the youth say, like, main character energy. We're not the main character. We're mm. the best friend in the corner who's like amplifying the school. Yeah, that supporting so character. We're, yeah, we're big supporting character energy. Mm. Um, we want the schools. So they're our number one partners, helping them. And then it's working with local food banks. So, like, making sure they're not buying food. 50% of our campuses almost are buying food from retail shops going to Ralph's or Costco on a Sunday and buying food mm -hmm. when their food bank could give it to them for free. Mm. So like making those relationships, right. Mm -hmm. Um, working with advocacy organizations that are on the ground, like the PERG network, um, different groups that can really help us build coalitions in local communities where we need them when we're doing advocacy work. Great. Um, and we're really trying to expand our partnership. So we work with a number of for-profit companies, which our students are sometimes skeptical of, rightly mm. so. Mm -hmm. um, but we find a really great middle ground. You know, companies like Sodexo and Aramark run food services on thousands of college campuses. Okay. We partner with both of them to help them build more equitable and just meal plan options, to give away free meal plans to students, to uh, like really advance our shared goals. So we have partners across the spectrum from okay. student groups to campuses to companies. So in part two of this interview, we're talking mainly about you. But now that you brought up 
Aramark and what was it called? Sodexo. Sodexo, which I'm not familiar with them at UNC Chapel Hill. I believe we still use Aramark, even though it's, I've been out of school for over 10 years. Um, I didn't have the best experience with Aramark. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. I bet it's a lot better now after you've been in. So what is that like? Like, how does the program get better? How do you advise them? Um, do you just come in and say your Wednesday and Thursday meal options are awful? <laughs> Let us give you some advice. Do you bring in the advice of chefs? Do you, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do it, in addition to like food, nutrition and quality and also distribution, are you mainly focusing on distribution? We're mainly focusing on access. Yeah. Okay, access, so yeah. we work with them to figure out which one of their, for instance, something we're working on right now is yeah. they can buy food at an ex extremely low rate because mm -hmm. they're buying so much of it and they have a great relationship with their suppliers. Right. We're working with them to see if they can help us source very low cost food delivered directly to food pantries. Mm -hmm. Right. So leveraging their supply chain mm -hmm. or, um, Sodexo, for instance, gave away tens of thousands of meals um, through just a negotiation that we had with them. Yeah. I'll also say that there are many companies, including other food companies, that we spent months meeting with mm. that I walked away from the table when it didn't feel right. So it's not like we're an open door to anyone that wants to give us just anything. Right. Um, it really is given what you're about to get, what you're about to gain from saying you're committed to this, mm -hmm. is that actually commensurate with what students will benefit. Yeah. Now there's a growing movement in some places or at some, some campuses to allow you to use meal plan credits to purchase food from other vendors. And I'm just curious about that because that was something that didn't exist when I was a student. And I think it's awesome. Is, is that a thing? Can you use meal plan credits more and more for, for healthy options like Mediterranean Deli? Yeah. I mean, what's happening is that companies like Aramark and Sodexo mm. are realizing that students want more options. Yeah. And if they want to win contracts, they have to have competitive options. So when you go to um, NACUFs, which is the, no, na mm. NACUFs. Yeah. The call, it's basically this, like there's a million higher ed conferences. One of them is just about higher ed dining services okay. and they will have people like Chick-fil-A there or like boba companies or kombucha companies being like, use us as a vendor in yeah. your sites. It's called NACFs. I think it's not, there's so many acronyms. There's so many. Yeah. 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 I'll look it up later. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So that's starting mm -hmm. to become a thing. And so they could use their um, meal plan credits for, yeah. for that. Which we think is great because oftentimes students have, and this is what we think about with food pantries, like can't just be ramen noodles. Mm -hmm. Ramen noodles distracted us from the fact that they were hungry college students for a long time. We're like, oh, they have this. That's cute and romantic. Mm. No, that's not sustainable. It's nice to have ramen as a choice every now and then, but not as your only option, right? So yeah. we love campuses giving students more options. Mm -hmm. I love what you do. Thank you. Thank you I for am very lucky to do what I get to do and to do it with an amazing team that I got. I got to call them my like Avengers. This like amazing team we built. So are the original Avengers from that went to medical school and that went to Silicon Valley, are they still part of it? No, no. they're just friends who like, you know, jump in the scene every now and then. And they help out. And um, we like have an amazing team that yeah. we've built over the past. I've been working on Swipe for almost nine years. September will be nine years. Wow. Full time, 12 years overall. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I don't know. The best part of my job is like the hardest part, which is making sure my team is happy mm. because if they're happy and they're clear and, you know, a team member is happy when they're clear on what their job is. Mm -hmm. They're clear on what their job is and they have the resources to do it. Then we're thriving. We went through a massive acquisition last year. Mm. We acquired the network of food pantries, which what really grew our work. Yeah. Our advocacy work took off. You know, we passed bills in multiple states last year, so we were very busy. Mm. Um, we have um, ten, nope, twelve full-time people right now in one open position. Wow! And as you know, soon I'll be transitioning out of my job. Yes, um, which is very. I'm I'm seeing as very energizing. Mm. That's great. Well, congratulations on this. Up, we'll talk about that in part two. The woman behind, you know, this organization, and well, the team behind it as well. Because I, I would love to go more into, um, you know, like ambiguity makes it harder to do your job. So having clear goals and metrics, and having 
a culture of radical candor and feedback is important and all of that. And it seems like you embody that in what you do. And I'd love to chat more about that and talk more about you. Um, but is there anything that you'd like to mention about swipe out hunger and, you know, one or two things that you'd like to leave the audience with, whether it's a lesson learned or resources, anything that's just important to you or top of mind? Anyone who knows a college student that could benefit from any of the programs I mentioned can go to swipehunger.org. We have an entire map where you can find your campus and get access to resources. Mm -hmm. If your campus is not there, email us and we'll connect you. Um, and I was looking earlier today at some of the, the responses our students have given us. And we never talk, we don't really share when students share their like sob stories because that's not the image we want in people's minds. Mm. We share the student who says, I couldn't have made it through without this program, mm -hmm. but I did. Or because of this program, I felt like my campus was actually built for students like me, mm. right? Mm -hmm. The moments where we amplify the resilience that the students showed, like that's who we're talking about. People who like, despite having very little money in the bank, very little time, are still choosing to freaking go to college. And like go to class, yeah. whether it's a community college or four year or whatever it is. Many of them are returning students. Many, many of them are parenting students. Like it's an amazing population of people we get to serve. And so we're very focused on like asset based framing, um, which is, I think, something more and more nonprofits are turning to. We don't use words like at risk. Right. Sure. So we really try and focus on the strength of our students. You said asset based framing. And that's about changing the way you talk about these things. Right. Exactly. And so what, so you, we don't say at risk. What do we say? Um, you just talk about that. We say college students. Yeah. College students that are maybe facing food insecurity, right? Yeah. Not um, hungry college students, mm -hmm. students facing food insecurity. Students. Experiencing. Okay. We, you know, okay, talking about lessons. Yeah. When I first started, when we all started Swipe, our name was Swipes for the Homeless. Because we were like <laughs> giving meal swipes to homeless people. And I tried to recruit a woman, Christine Margiata, to our board. And she's like, you're real cute, Rachel. This is a nice idea, but I'm not joining this organization. And I asked her why. And she mm. said a few things. But for one, your name is Swipes for the Homeless. Mm. Number one, you don't work on homelessness. And number two, putting the word the before any population objectifies them. Mm. It takes away their humanity. Interesting. And I'm like, okay, I'm 22 at this point. Like, I I never thought about this. Again, like, I'm just trying to do something. And so I said, if I change the name, will you join the board? And she said, yeah. The first meeting at her first board meeting was to change the name. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, let's immediately do this. Like, why am I objectifying people, right? So language like using word the, before you say any population, mm. like I'm Jewish, like I would never say the Jews. So okay. It doesn't sound very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, Makes sense. And the same thing with any population we're serving. Oh, wow. That, yeah. I think I learned something right there. <laughs> That's so helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you're focused on hunger, right? It's like swiping out hunger. You're not, you know, it's not for the population that you're serving, which is a multifaceted, like intricate level of people facing food insecurity, lack of income. I don't know if you'd even say that or how you would frame that, but no, yeah, that's yeah, all right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just, I've learned something really cool. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, anything else you'd like to leave the audience with before we, I think everything else goes into the part two of okay. like my life, my learned lessons as okay. a leader, which I'm very passionate um, about imparting because, you know, I've been doing this for a long time Yeah, and choosing to leave now when we have the strongest financial position, hmm. we have the most recognition. I have a badass team. It's kind of like I'm leaving at our peak. Ooh. Right. This, this is like, and the audience thinks to themselves, why Rachel? Why? <laughs> why? Why Rachel? Why? Because I don't, because I'm so afraid of being a nonprofit leader that stayed at their job for too long, mm. especially the youth led movement. Youth right now don't care about like institutional stuff. Mm. They care about movements. They care about people who with a vision. And I don't want this organization to be about any one person, right? For a long time, it was about a founder and I want it to not really have, I want it to have many faces, sure. right? Um, and so 
the, like that. And also like I turned 30 and had my Saturn return, whatever my friends all tell me is happening. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, there's maybe more in me that I've dedicated 12 years to this <laughs> in Judaism and uh, around Passover, we say Dayanu, which means yeah. enough. Right. And my like executive coach was like, Rachel Dayanu, like you've given enough. Cause I had this guilt of like, can I actually leave? Mm. Um, and so it's just been an unwinding. That's, that's interesting. I want to talk more about this in part two. Cool. I want to talk much more about the why and also what's next. Um, wow. You gave me so much to think about. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel. Of course. Um, I'm always really excited to share about our work. And even though I'm moving on, I'll always be the founder and this will always be like my first kid. Beautiful. I feel like I'm sending it off to college now. It's interesting. You're, you, you are sending it off to college. Um, and in part two, I definitely want to return to something you said at the beginning of the conversation, which was because that's what society makes us feel like we have to do or expected to do. Mm -hmm. But there are many other paths. Indeed. And there are also maybe people facing food insecurity who are on those other paths who are not going to school. So maybe that'll be Rachel Sumek, part two. Oh my gosh. Or, may, or maybe you'll get out of solving hunger. I don't know. I don't know what you'll do next. But I just want to say thank you for your impact in the world. I, I appreciate that. And um, it's been an absolute like dream to have spent the past decade really throwing myself into something that um, we've been able to actually move the needle on. Thank you, Rachel. Cool. Thanks, Jared. Okay. What our remarkable guest didn't mention is she is the original architect of the Hunger Free Campus Bill, which has sent more than $70 million to colleges across five states to fund anti-hunger programs on campuses. And she made the Forbes 30 under 30 list. I am really looking forward to part two tomorrow when Jared and Rachel interrogate the next part of her journey as a young dynamic leader in transition, knowing it's time for her to move on and swipe out hunger to move forward under new leadership. So hit the notifications and be sure to join us tomorrow for Rachel's insights into how the when and why of stepping down as founder is as important as identifying the need that catalyzed your passion in the first place. Until next time, stay inspired. The Nonprofit Podcast, powered by DonorBox, helping you help others.